idea is that those who have gone through discipleship books uh, think that they're finished when it comes to discipleship, but in reality, it trains them how to do discipleship. The problem is, is they never get around to actually doing discipleship with people because they're too busy going through the books. Well, good afternoon, Scott Duncan. Hello. Um, everybody at Bible Study Company um, and whoever uh, Scott shares us with, uh, we are having a podcast, which I'm finding very interesting. Be and um, I've got Dr. Scott Duncan, who um, is the uh, pastor of discipleship at River Cities Community Church in West Virginia. So you'll you'll uh, definitely hear a little bit of a Southern drawl. That's right. We first the first question we have to we always ask at Bible City Company is do you got yourself I get uh, a beverage? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. You got to turn that around because it had a saying on it. It does. It says Henry's dad. <laughs> is that your little guy's name? No. <laughs> So, so you just blew you just blew all of the um, ladies here that was were going. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it would be sweet, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, actually, what that is is uh, uh, you met Pastor Henry uh, a while back. Uh, he's the uh, Latino pastor of our church uh, or one of our churches, and uh, there is a, a special needs girl who always thought that I was Pastor Henry's dad. Oh, and so. His or her mom actually got me a cup that said Henry's dad. And so uh, it, it was from that young lady. Oh. And so uh, the funny thing is, is Pastor Henry is older than me. So. Oh, <laughs> so so we so we can all then now re go. Oh, that's so nice. Yes, exactly. Yeah, very good. But that's what that is. When I <laughs> Henry's dad and has a little heart. That's so good. Okay, so the um, folks, uh, what I'd like to do is um, Scott and I have had several discussions online, and we got to know each other, and uh, gave him a tour of Bible, of Bible study company because anybody can do that. But in YouTube, what we always have to do is we always have to ask you to like and subscribe this because this is how we grow the. The channel and actually by Bible study company is starting to grow. So uh, with this this resource, um, I think Scott, um, you could actually say that anybody that's a pastor um, or anybody thinking about doing discipleship kind of needs to rethink discipleship it, just in general. What what is it involved and why why should we even worry about it? Um, and I, I know it's a command in the Bible, and it's kind of a buzzword. Everybody wants to do uh, discipleship. And here, I've actually got a pastor of discipleship on the line. Now, what happened is Scott um, asked me a question if Bible Study Company had some resources like reading plans mm -hmm. uh, to do. And, and, and we do, uh, but that's not to show here what what we're doing it's there's it's in our app if you want some um reading plans however um when i but it perplexed me because reading plans what i've seen is and, and is this a fair question um to bring up or a fair statement is people have a tendency to speed read through like if they have a big goal to read through the scriptures they'll speed read through the scriptures and miss a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to pick up the phone and um, ask you some questions uh, about being a disciple. And what you're seeing is most effective. And to my surprise, it was the same thing that I was seeing. So I'm setting all that up yeah. so that we can get into this because I'd really like to have Scott break down as a discipleship pastor exactly what his experience has been in this area. Yeah, I, 
as I think about the idea of discipleship, you're right, it goes back to the command or the commission that we've been given in Matthew 28 uh, to go and make disciples of all nations. And uh, I think one of the things that we tend to do is somebody comes to know Christ and instantly we take them to Romans, uh, which uh, if that's where you need to be, OK. But I, I tend to wonder if it would be good to go back to the Gospels and introduce them to who Jesus is and what he has said and what he has taught. And, and I realize there's the Gospels tell the story before the cross and Romans is after the cross. And I, I get that. And I think there's an important differentiation there. But you know, the thing that we're seeing is uh, I, I've been here for 15 years and I've been doing this, uh, serving in this role for that, that amount of time and have used everything from the two seven series from the navigators uh, to some things from Campus Crusade, things from Warren Wearsby, uh, almost anything we can get our hands on. But the thing that I'm finding is that uh as people do those uh, or go through those studies, they actually end up thinking that they are then discipled when they finish a book, rather than realizing that most of those books say this is a, a pattern of discipleship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, can you just go ahead and restate that? Okay. So when people would go through the different types of studies, where whether it was the two seven series or or whatever. Uh, when they get done with that book, they or the series of books, because that actually has four books to it, uh, they tend to think that, OK, now I am discipled. I have completed the, uh, you know, that course of work. And so I'm now a disciple. When in reality, those books tend to say, here's a pattern for discipleship. And uh, so that that's the thing that I think that the is confusing. When you say pattern for discipleship, what do you mean by a pattern? Yeah, so so most of those studies will say, read the scriptures, mm -hmm. pray, mm -hmm. learn how to share your testimony, um, those, those types of things. But the people spend so much time in those books that they end up not doing the study. So does that make more sense? Yeah, and what's really interesting to me is is you just showed a danger mm -hmm. um, that people could have because one in our discussion about this, one of the things that I um, have seen if I stood up in the pulpit uh, and had a teaching and I asked everybody there, um, "Are you a disciple?" and you would or the people there would raise their hands. Mm -hmm. And then if I started to ask a series of questions, I'd see less and less hands. Yeah. So um, why does the church or why do people in the church think that they're disciples if they um, don't do the things that disciples should do? Now, again, that's a broad sweeping logical fallacy because it is a sweeping gen generalization right and that leads to this this next question um which i'll hold off to the side because i want you to answer that one okay because you have to be seeing that in the church you know as a i mean there wouldn't be a need for a pa a, a discipleship pastor right yeah that's I would agree. If you ask the majority of folks or many folks in a church, if they're disciples, I think they would say yes, um, because I think that people confuse the idea of a Christian and a disciple. Yeah. Uh, and, and really, it probably needs to be reversed to some degree because we were called to be disciples and we were called Christians or they were called Christians. Um, but we are called to be disciples. And I think that the reason that folks uh, land on the idea of going through the books. One, uh, as we talked about before, it's easier. Um, you know, the second thing would be, uh, I think it kind of fits our culture. You know, you do four years and you have your, your degree. And so it tends to fit that same kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the things that plays into that as well. The cultural training that, that we all have, that we swim in. Yeah, and I was explaining to you that, that um, for all the years that I was in churches, now again, this is a 
dramatic sweeping generalization and shouldn't be pointed at anybody's, you know, finger or blamed anybody. I can't find any time, unless I completely missed it, mm -hmm. that somebody sat down and showed me how to study the Bible. Right. The problem is just exactly what you said. We go, if, if I said right now to your congregation or, or ours at Christ Community, let's have a Bible study or let's learn how to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. People have a tendency, like you said, because we spend so many years in college and school and training, all the, everything's training, 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 yeah. um, to like zone out. Because somehow, some way, it gets connected to, like, being religious right. more than um, than having a relationship. But the weird part is, um, a fr like, we have a friend, his name is Dr. Baruch Corman mm -hmm. uh, from Love Israel. And when I first met him, I'd, I'd heard things from him about studying scripture that I'd never heard before. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that is, is I always was saying, well, Dr. Baruch taught me how to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. And my wife corrects me as she does lo lovingly, Scott, yes. lovingly, um, wink, wink. Um, she, uh, she said, Rick, um, Dr. Brooke didn't teach you to study the Bible. You actually broke down his teachings and figured out what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And then you put it into practice. Now, the, that he, he kept saying one thing all the time, and that was, we need to live a praiseworthy life to God. That, mm -hmm. that had never, I had never understood that at all. Yeah. In fact, what I'll do is I'll have Mary put up... Um, on here, uh, a frame, these two frames that we have. One is a U frame where I'm in the middle of the frame and God's supposed to meet my needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, cause now I'm a Christian or the other frame where this is his house and his rules. Yeah. And, um, and I go looking for his will as a servant, not right. as somebody that wants him to, I, I hate to say this out loud, but be a giant vending machine in the sky. Right. And um, and you've heard it before. You know, you got folks that do this declaring and decreeing all the time, yeah. which, you know, I, uh, I don't I don't want to. That's not the purpose of this thing, but it's driving me. that drives me crazy. It's like, how, how 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 can you ask a king? How can you declare something? Right. Um, but we can stand on his word. Right. So um, that was the perplexing thing for me was. um once we started, Mary and I started as a husband and wife bumbling along um, and discovering that there are actually principles that mm -hmm. you can employ, you know, um, lots of them, actually, hermeneutics, all kinds of different things. Then all of a sudden, scripture takes on a completely different meaning, right. not, a, not a different meaning, but you actually, I actually sensed the, the, I don't want to go by my feelings, but I sensed the, the, um, the Lord's like pleasure in a sense, because we're taking his word seriously, right. just like the disciples did mm -hmm. and Moses did. Yeah. So well, I think one of the things, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and that led to one of the reasons that you and I were talking was that's what you when I called you? That's exactly what you said. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. I'd really, yeah. we'd really, I'd really like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that you're right. When we begin to put the scriptures in the proper framework, and we begin to understand what the scriptures say rather than what we want them to say, exactly, then, uh, we come in in alignment with God's will and God's mind, rather than trying to drag Him <laughs> kicking and screaming, I guess, uh, by our faith into alignment with with us you know him in alignment with us rather than the other but yeah the 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 issue that caused our call was that idea of you know wanting to have some way of of encouraging men is who i was talking about but it could be men or women to read the scriptures together 
Right. And so you using that checkoff list, not a, as a Lord or a boss, but to keep track of where, where we are and then having that soft accountability with each other. I like, I like how you said that about soft accountability mm-hmm. because um, now when you say a checkoff box, what are you meaning mm-hmm. by that? Yeah. So some folks will use the plan, uh, you know, a Bible reading plan, whether it's through the nest, uh, through the new Testament or the whole Bible or whatever. And so they have, they have to make sure they get that list checked off, you know, within 365 days. Right. <laughs> and yeah, in my mind, I, I had to actually switch the way I looked at it and say, this is keeping track of where I am so that I don't forget when I come back tomorrow. Or if I miss a day, it's not the end of the world. You know, I don't have to beat myself up. I can come back and pick up where I was. You know, if there's something that needs to be confessed and repented of because I was being uh, lazy or slothful or whatever, uh, okay. But I'm able to get back into that idea of, you know, where am I? Uh, rather than it being a law, because you know, if you think about what it says in Romans chapter five, probably around verse thirty, mm-hmm. it says, "But the law came in, so sin would increase." Okay. So one of the things that I have seen in in my life, and other people have pointed out, is when a law is laid down, our flesh will rise up. Yeah, yeah. And again, they always use the uh, the sign, "Keep off the grass." What do you want to do? You want to step on it? Yeah. If you're driving fifty five down the interstate, you're fine until you see. That's the speed limit. And then you want to go faster. Uh, So what I'm finding is if I use my checkoff list to read the New Testament or the book of Romans or whatever as a law, my flesh will respond against it. But if I use it to keep track of where I am, then I am then submitting that to God. I guess you could say I have self-control, spirit of God, self-control, so that. I actually grow in my faith rather than, you know, checking off the list, trying to keep the commandments, trying to do all of the things in order to please God. Yeah. um, That, I think that is an outstanding way to explain it because you, you can actually feel it inside in a way Mm -hmm. um, when, when it's like, well, I've got to read um, a chapter every day. Yeah. um, You know, to meet my goal where, Mm -hmm. Now we're looking to the spirit of God to help us stay on track um, for a goal we set. And I think that's really good. And then I remember when uh, Dr. Brook was going through um, this one area of acts Mm -hmm. and he said, you don't need a PhD. You don't need to have a formal Bible um, degree yeah. To know that you need to pray over the scriptures and, and don't leave a scripture until the Holy Spirit reveals to you what he's trying to say there. Right. Which, yeah, yeah which then led me to want to, you know, and go to seminary. And what's weird is there are people that are listening to this, depending mm-hmm. on, you know, the denominational acronym that they're in, they would say, well, you, and Believe me, seminaries can be dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to know, you have to go in with wide, eyes wide open. Right. But the thing that's interesting to me is I actually had a man say, and I grew up in a system where they said, no, don't go to cemetery. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> seminary. <laughs> um, because it's you're just going to get dead religion. Yeah. Well, I did go to seminary. And the and and so did you. You just finished finished your uh, doctorate, and so and congrats for that. Okay. Um, but the thing that's uh, interesting to me is the disciples went through an entire. And I just sent you a PDF on this. Mm-hmm. They went through an entire three and a half years. Right now, that was just with Christ, but they'd been trained in. Mm-hmm. Their uh, synagogues right. from a young age up into f- age 15. And the Jewish pe- people are still doing that called yeshivas, right. they call them. Right. So, I mean, I don't know how we can think that we don't need training to learn how to, to properly focus ourselves. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree because I think that if we're left, on our own, then I'm going to read the scriptures from my filter. 
you right. know, from my history, from things that have happened, even from my denominational or or non-denominational background, uh, rather than saying, no, there's actually a framework. There's a hermeneutic that has to be used uh, as we're reading and studying the scriptures. So absolutely. Yeah. And um, like we have the literal historical grammatical. Now, what, pe what people don't understand about the literal <laughs> is it's not reading it literally it's how the literature is written if it's poetry you write it right. as poetry if it's symbolism it's there you're yeah. very careful with symbolism correct um but you can have types and shadows because yeah. that's what scripture said um Definitely. all of the old testament is a historical narrative but the hebrew writer he he did he pointed out types and shadows yeah. so it's okay for us to look at spiritual lessons like that. But I think to not get some training is a mistake, mm -hmm. but your 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 comment at the very beginning should really wake up the church and say maybe we've had enough of programs and books. Mm -hmm. And this is a question that I posed and I'd like you to comment on that. But this is a question that I posed to you when we first discussed this. And that is, like Nathan Rice, um, the pastor of our church, believes that the church, and you may feel this way too, um, and your pastor might as well, uh, that the church is the place for discipleship. Mm -hmm. Then you have groups of people who look at this, and let's let's just call me my, myself a a pew sitter. I'm sitting in the pew. I'm the one that raised my hand and said, I'm a disciple, even though I don't have any training. Mm -hmm. um, but I say back to somebody, um, I can look at the church and say, um, what program do you have? Well, well, what do you mean? Um, what do you mean? What program? We have, we have men's Bible study and we have women's Bible study. We have um, a Warren Wiersbe book. We have navigators, we have this, we have that, we, we, we have all this going on. Well, that's not discipleship to me. Well, then you press the person that's asking that question, and they don't really know what discipleship is. Right. So I'm wondering, in this conundrum of you being in the church, mm -hmm. me kind of looking from the outside, trying to get a hold of the hold of church, in a sense, and understand the community aspect of it, how, how would you answer those questions? How would you deal with both sides? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because that's actually something that I've wrestled with, uh, well, most of my ministry because what I want to say is everybody needs to be discipled in the, in the church like the four walls. Yeah. But I think that it is, I think there's a mix. I don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think the idea is as you are going, not as you are going to church, but as the church is going, uh, we are making disciples. So I think that there is the aspect that within the four walls, there's discipleship going on. That's our call. That's our, our commission. But I also think it is as the man is the doctor you know, at work, as the person is at school, as the one of the things that I like the idea of, and I'm trying to to pray and think about is, you know, we complain about all of these parents taking their kids out, out of church and going into the sports leagues and traveling, doing travel ball. Yeah. Because and, Wednesday night used to be for churches. And yeah. Gone. Well, and they're even there, they are even traveling on Sundays and everything else. Yeah. And so my thought is, and again, kind of talking out loud here in front of everybody uh, is why don't we equip those people to disciple as they're going on the travel ball team because they're going to see people that I, I will never see. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it is outside the walls as well. I like to say, and I have no idea where I got this, but I like to say we've all been given the same call, make disciples, but we all do it from different vocations and locations for that matter. Well, yeah. And, and, and the, the people that what I'm seeing is to give confirmation to what, you've discovered is, and, and we'll talk more about what you've seen, like mm -hmm. practically the results of right. you taking a group of men and doing soft accountability. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I've seen is 
these people are in their jobs all the time. And then all of a sudden, people are starting to come to the church. Yeah. And they're coming to Bible studies that are real Bible studies. Like, for example, we're doing Ephesians, but we're not using a book. Right. We're, we're soft going through Ephesians and we in soft meaning that we're reading the text. And then we're not saying, what do you think about this? Right. There, there has to be a little bit of leader preparation to say, mm -hmm. hey, have you thought about this? Right. Have you considered this? Do you know the historical background? Right. These are all principles in how to study the Bible that Absolutely. they may not even realize is happening. But right. you've just given them tools that they can use now in their own personal life, which yeah. then you said, that's why it was so exciting to talk to you which you said that's exactly true. And you had several stories, which I'd yeah, like yeah. to hear again. Yeah. So, yeah, the thing that really lit my fire uh, to to begin to talk about this is uh, we have a man, well, a man that used to go to the church here. He now lives in Texas. And uh, but before he moved, he was working in a factory that's a few miles down the road. And he would always ask these guys to read the scriptures with him. And so for a long time, nobody would do it. Nobody would do it. And then all of a sudden, there were these few guys who began to do it. And so then they would get together and they had, again, what I'm calling soft accountability. Sure. It was not, you know, he wasn't busting their chops. They basically had a text thread and they would say, hey, I read John chapter one today. And somebody else would say, I read John chapter one. So you have all of that. And then they would get together uh, periodically and they would talk about what it is that they were were reading and so what happened is more and more people started to to kind of join this this movement, for lack of a better way of saying it. And uh, then the man retired and moved to Texas. It's like, <laughs> but there's another man that was absolutely an opponent of his in the factory who came to Christ because he began to read scripture. And now he's the champion in that factory. And so. Uh, last year, I think it was, he continued to ask people, hey, will you read scripture with me? And they had 40 guys yeah. in that factory. And we're talking like a steel factory. Yeah. They were reading scripture together. Uh, you know, some of them began to trust Christ. Uh, I shared with you the story of the guy who had terminal cancer. Uh, they went on strike. And when they came back from the strike, uh, and maybe even during the strike, he began to change. And all of a sudden, he was serving people and helping people. And people were like, you know, what has happened? And so we had the honor of baptizing that guy. Oh, and man. So physically, yeah, he, he still has terminal cancer. But as you said in our discussion, you know, he has been healed. Yeah. So, yeah. And I appreciated that when you said that. Yeah. And what's, yeah. And that's Isaiah 53. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. We, and, I, and I had a dear friend named Irv Puckett, which you got to follow. And Irv, um, we, he got saved in the middle of um, having um, this cancer yeah. and uh, the same thing. We would, he, we would, he, Scott, what was so amazing is he said to me the first day, the first um, day after he got saved, he, he was not wanted to talk to me again. And he said, I just don't think God can save me. And I said, oh, why? And he goes, I've done too much bad in my life. Yeah. I said, and then I opened up the scripture and I said, in John three, it says, for God so loved the whole world that yeah. he gave. I said, so is your sin bigger than the whole world? And it was just like, boom, right there. Yeah. He was okay. Yeah. Well, the next day he came in and he, and he said, I've got cancer. I'm on disability. I'm got chemotherapy. I don't even leave my house. I don't hardly even have any friends. Yeah, I don't think God can use me. I want to tell everybody I know about. Yeah. I be, be, basically I'm I was so blind and now I see. Yeah, and I, and I said, well, Irv, let's ask him. I said, be honest with the Lord, tell him your fears, yeah. and then tell him what you'd like to do. Mm -hmm. And then this was in kind of 2020 in the middle of COVID, and he said, um, and and then two weeks later, he was um, in a youth prison speaking his testimony <laughs> yeah and then it just went out from there and then th the last time we saw i mean so many people came to christ yeah um 
through through him and he prayed for people in the hospital when he was going through his emergency room stuff and um you know it was just uh just very very powerful yeah um yeah so and this just came just having you know what questions do you have like you said you know now the what the strange thing you get is you can watch youtube videos ad infinitum or yeah. as they say ad nauseum yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and uh it's either somebody bashing somebody else or some or somebody giving good teaching and right. um the thing is is that how do people so that they don't get off what is your recipe now as a, as a pastor going through the navigators going through books mm -hmm. um what is your pat what is your pattern now yeah um that you are preferring because yeah. as a discipleship pastor um well first off bible study would come you would love to help but yeah um i'm so interested in this concept mm -hmm. yeah so I still will use the the books to some degree because I want people to see that pattern. Yep. But what I'm trying to do instead of introducing them to the pattern through the book, if I don't have to, I would prefer to just introduce them to the idea, you know, just them and the scriptures and begin to allow them to read and read, read. Uh, because again, what we're seeing is the folks that are reading the scriptures on their own or in a group, they are growing far more, or maybe I should say more quickly than those who are reading the Bible and then also spending time in somebody else's book. Yeah. So. Yeah. And to, there was this little church that we were part of, me and Irv, and um, I shared with you before that this church has for years done Warren Wiersbe's mm -hmm. books. Yeah. Now, you'll have to forgive me and, and anybody else that's watching, please forgive me too. But I didn't know who Warren Wiersbe was. Now, some people in the Southern Baptist side of life would absolutely think I was a heretic to be burned, but you would understand if you knew the whole story. But anyway, the thing is, is that I didn't know who he was. Right. And this church liked to use his books. Mm -hmm. And later I found out from the elders, um, cause like Irv and I would say, why don't we just study the Bible? Right. And um, and they're like, well, this is a lot. They didn't say it was like a lot easier, but it was easier on them because mm -hmm. they had professional lives. And so to have a book and go through it gave the people fellowship, but it also put them in the word of God and created, um, you know, places to discuss. Right. But Irv and I felt like it was yes we can get the fellowship but we were dramatically missing mm -hmm. um a part a component and i'm wondering as you look back in your experience and you look back at our scenario what do you think was like the missing part that we weren't getting because yeah. it ended up being like this why are we doing a Bible, and this is this is ignorance on our on our part. So please forgive me and everybody else. But why are we doing a Bible study from somebody who's who's not here anymore? Right. Why are we reading a book? Yeah. What's funny is as we're we're talking about this, I'm I'm I glanced over at the picture of me in my office sitting in front of lots of books. <laughs> So obviously I'm not against books, right. but uh, yeah, I, I think the problem is we're reading somebody else's mail to some degree. Actually, I would say it a different way, because even when we're reading scripture, we're reading someone else's mail to some degree. Yeah. But we're reading someone else's interpretation of someone else's mail. Yeah. And, and I think that it is uh, one of the ways that I've heard it explained is rather than talking to your neighbor and having your neighbor communicate to your wife what it is that you want to say and what she wants to say. Why don't you just talk to your wife? Yeah. 
because then you're living out of the relationship your neighbor has with your wife, which is not healthy. That's a whole different discussion. <laughs> but uh, uh, when we're talking about Christ, why do we not spend time with him and his word? Yeah. You know, can Warren Wearsby be helpful? Yes. Is he perfect? No. Yeah. Just like none of us are. Yeah. So I think that the missing piece is that personal interaction with the word of God and the spirit of God, because he uses his word by the power of his spirit to change us, to mature us. And, and so I think that that's a piece that is missing. Yeah. And did and you had also mentioned that when you get people going, going and started in this, mm-hmm. then they have a tendency. And this is exactly what I saw. Um, I've got potentially two, two young men that you know, I started to, ch- to challenge their thinking and their, their Bible thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and they ended up coming to the Bible study, the men's yeah. Bible study. But now they're looking at possibly seminaries because it's having such a gigantic change in their life. Yeah. And that's what Mary and I saw was our, our relationship started getting healed. Mm-hmm. Um, for years of being in certain doctrines with that you had to put filters on. Yeah. You were, um, and it, and it could be anything for anyone, Yeah, whatever filter you're, you're reading the Bible through, mm-hmm. you need to know why you believe what, what you believe. Right. Because, the, and it's, you know, you know what I mean? Cause we've mm-hmm. got lots of tools out there that can help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the good thing is, is we're not say, saying don't use those tools. Obviously, a Bible study company has plenty of tools to offer. Um, but that idea of being willing to wrestle through the things that uh, maybe you grew up thinking yeah. uh, or the filter that, that I had growing up because of, like I said, experiences or whatever the case may be. Uh, when we are face to face with the scripture and we uh, kind of like Dr. Corman says, allow the spirit of God to show us what the word says. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that takes longer than what we want. And I think that's part of the problem as well. Uh, but when we allow the word of God to, to impact us in that way, then our mind is changed. I mean, the word of God, as it says, is living and active and sharper than a two edged sword. And it actually gets down to the discerning of the heart, discerning of the attitudes and the motives and things like that and changes those he does. Yeah. Yeah, and now and now we can um, follow the Holy Spirit. Yes, you know, because um, how else are we going to be changed in the battle? According to Romans twelve one, is is in our mind, right? And we need our mind renewed by Scripture. But mm-hmm. you know that only goes so far. And Paul was dealing with a carnal church, right? In in Corinthians, and yeah. some people just don't know. Um, yeah even if they're saved and it's okay to check with them. Do you understand the gospel? Right. Well, where did you get that? Well, yeah. it's from quite a few years of study, mm-hmm. you know, and then as soon as you say study their, their eyes like lays over. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually have a group that, that meets on Wednesday nights. Uh, we've been together for a while, but we started through the two seven series and things like that. And, and I made the shift because of began to see. What's that? That's the Navigators 2-7, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and as I was looking at what we were doing, it's like, get grief. We just need to have these folks in the scriptures. And so now uh, with that group, and again, some variation of that group has been together for a few years because we've been through the Gospel of Matthew. We have been through, uh, we're going through Romans now. Uh, we've been through... Uh, Hebrews, so several scriptures. Uh, one guy said we studied the entire Bible through the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> so, well, that's probably true. So, what took us two years to do it, um, but it you takes patience and hard work. And you started going, uh, it led all to all these. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what's going on in our men's Bible study. It's mm-hmm. very exciting to people. Yeah. Well, like you guys mentioned before in some of your podcasts, Scripture interprets Scripture. Yeah, yeah. I had somebody say to me the other day, well, how can you use the Bible to to back up the Bible? And I said, well, if it was one book, and I know it's one author, but I said, if it was one book written by one human author, then that would be a problem. But what we have is a library of books that tell the same story with 
yes, the Holy Spirit, but multiple authors over thousands of years. Some of them didn't know each other. We have kings, we have servants, we have all of these different folks, and they still, still tell the same story. So yes, I think that we can take the scriptures and back the scriptures up with the scriptures. Well, I so agree with you because I, I like to hear these people in, that are, are from church. And I'll say, ah, the Bible is just written by men. Yeah. And again, like you said, um, it's circular reasoning to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And I said, yeah. and, and I'll say now, I'll say, well, just almost identical what you said is, yeah. well, what would you need um, from ancient literature to back up the Bible? And they said, well, a whole lot of books. I said, well, then do you know how the Bible's written? And they'll say, well, no. And I'll say, well, it's 66 books with 37, depending on who, who you're looking at, or yeah. 40 authors yeah. over 1,500 years. Yeah. That's, not, uh, that's not a book. That's a library of yeah. ancient documents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. and it tell, like you said, tells the same story, but 30% of it, is mm -hmm. also a uh, prophecy and right. a lot of it's still coming true, but a lot of it's come true already. Correct. Yeah. So there's no other holy book like that on the right. planet. In fact, all of those, all those books, if you find them will, I shouldn't use that. Um, any of the books that you can find that are holy books will mm -hmm. tell you, you need to work and be a good person. Um, right. And this is the only book that says, Nah, you're really bad from the start, and uh, you need help, yeah. and you're not, and you're not as good as you think you are. Yeah, and so um, you and the Lord will save you, and yeah. you know, uh, and and Genesis cleans up why the Lord had to come, even in the Trinity, He had yeah. to come as fully God and fully man because Adam and Eve sinned. Right. Well, Rick, where did you get that? Well, it's because I'm studying scripture right. to live a praiseworthy life. Yeah. That's what our goal is. Yeah. Because yeah. all of us are going to have to stand before him. And this is his word. And we get a chance to understand his word from the God of the universe. And right. he's speaking directly to me in these pages. Yeah. You know, I don't need to guess. I don't need to go look for false prophets or anything. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. If you look at many of the, the holy books, as you're talking about, many of them were essentially written by one author. Yeah. Uh, and or they were very close together. And so that's a, a very big difference with the scriptures like you were talking about. And not to mention, you know, the the number of manuscripts that have been found that back up the, the New Testament specifically, but also the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, the, the proof that is there. If, if somebody needs that, but, but seeing people interact with the scripture, you know, I, I think of a young man that uh, we were going through the book of Romans. This was a different study. This was a group of men that I was going through Romans with and watching this young man read the scriptures. He was 10 years younger than everybody else in there. Uh, but, but watching him read the scripture and watching him just weep. Yeah. He was a believer. It's not that he was, you know, a living a life of full blown sin, uh, he wasn't perfect by any stretch, neither, you know, none of us are. But watching him read the scriptures and see how God used that to move in his heart. And then God did call him to seminary and he became an assistant pastor for a while. And then a, uh, I think a, a headmaster at a school, a Christian school of some sort. And so every once in a while we stay in touch, but he is continuing to grow and study and read. Yeah, that's it's. It's not any, I'll just say it this way. It's not any Christianity I've ever run into because I, I was in a, gr a group and they, you wouldn't call them Pentecostal or charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the Pentecostals or charismatics would probably call them very religious. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I was in charismatic Pentecostal, you know, non-denominational mm -hmm. churches and what ended up happening is over years is um, the promise, we, we, we said that the Bible was our foundation, but we didn't act like it. Yeah. We didn't know how to study it. We didn't know what hermeneutics hardly was. Yeah. And, um, and, and, the, and the other thing is we were chasing people's books. 
We were chasing conferences, the next mm -hmm. revival, the next experience. Experience sure. became our uh, what, you know, and, you know, there, every person that you talked to was like, oh, the Lord spoke to me this, Lord spoke to me that. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, I got thinking about it. And in Judaism, the, um, the Lord's name is so holy, they won't even speak it. They call him Hashem or the name. Right. So, um, you know, and that's why I was saying back to Baruch, you know, um, and love Israel. What's interesting to, to me is he tries to take off as many filters as you can. Mm -hmm. However, yeah. he's Jewish, mm -hmm. got saved, and now lives in Israel. Yeah. And so looks and dresses like an Orthodox Jewish person. And part sure. of that is to help witness, but he's also plugging into how, you know, Judaism operates through the course of their year, you know? Yeah. So, um, so that, that actually becomes a filter itself. Yeah. Sure. So, so no matter how we try, yeah. we have to work really hard to get rid of these filters. Yeah. And I think that's something that the spirit of God has to do over time as we read the scriptures. Because I, I remember at one point in life, as I was reading the scriptures, all of these things changed in my thinking. Yep. I began to understand the word of God better. I'm not going to say different, but better. And I thought, my walls have fallen down. Hey, uh, I'm no longer this or I'm no longer that. Not realizing I was just in a bigger box. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so the spirit of God continues to, to open my eyes and my heart and my mind uh, to, to the truth of his word. And, and I still don't claim that I've got the market cornered on that. You know, he's still teaching me and will be until I'm with him and probably beyond that. Well, and um, you and I became friends, um, you know, from casually talking online, but I've really, really appreciated your entire approach it's, um, to all of this. And one of the things that I, I wanted to kind of like, if you were to conclude all this, and mm -hmm. I'll read a, a, a conclusion from, uh, the paper I sent on discipleship during Jesus time, because okay. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a historical fan of first century Judaism, because yeah. I want to know what their thinking was. Sure. But if you were to kind of encapsulate the 15 years you've had of discipleship, seeing what works, doesn't work, what the person that is my friend that's looking at the church saying it doesn't do discipleship. And mm -hmm. you've got the pastor over here, that's saying, no, the whole church is there for pastorship. And part of what he's, the pastor's saying is absolutely true because you've got such a wide variety of people in, in the church and they all have different needs. Mm -hmm. So if you were to kind of in, in your mind, like bullet point this of what to try, and what, and like if everybody's kind of tired of the latest book, yeah. um, what would you say? would be the best approach yeah. from, from, and that has the most um, impact on people's yeah. lives. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I would say is, and a guy had to convince me of this is because I, I grew up being a truth guy with the word. Yeah. Whether I was living it or not, that's where I, you know, I'm a truth guy. What does and a truth guy mean? Meaning, yeah, a good question. Uh, studying the scripture. So if you came to a Bible study with me, uh, I don't care if you have time to, to chit chat or if you have any snacks or getting into the Bible. So just be quiet and let me teach. That's where I was. And so one of the things that this man helped me understand is there has to be truth. There also has to be relationship. Yes. And I think that when we talk about discipleship, there has to be both of those things. And in, in the, the document that you sent, there is that idea of spending life together yeah. Uh, living in the dust of the rabbi, as as uh, uh, Ray Vanderlaan and others have said, um, but that truth and relationship are, are are key because relationship without truth is dangerous, and truth without relationship is harsh. Yeah, and that is so true, Scott. I think that's a that's a big wake up call for a lot of people. Oh, it is for me. Oh yeah, and yeah. I still wrestle with that. Yeah, um, because, again, I would rather jump in the word. But but I guess if I summarized everything uh, the best that I can, it would be the idea of spend time with people, spend time with them in the word. So that you can communicate so you can think through and it's not just a, a sharing of our ignorance um, because that happens as well. But it's it's that idea of 
let's talk about what we're seeing in the passage of scripture. If there's something that that you don't understand or I don't understand, let's go find out. And, and then come back together and let's talk about it. And maybe it's over a cup of coffee. Maybe it is, uh, you know, at the park or the hospital or, or wherever it may be. Um, so that I think that's where I would say that soft accountability is, is really accountability, as one man said, is not based on authority. It's based on love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if somebody loves me, they're able to hold me accountable. If somebody's my authority, I'm going to want to buck against that authority. Yeah. And I, and I say this a lot because I've got some younger men that, like I was saying, that are wanting to learn how to study scripture and live praiseworthy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they'll say, oh, I really appreciate this or I appreciate that. And I go, listen, I appreciate you because you're, you're hungry yeah. Like I was brand new and, and I want to, even though you've been a Christian for a while, this is a whole new world, right? And I'll go, yeah. I go, well, that whole new world, you're reflecting back on me mm-hmm. and I need that. Yeah. And that's why we're, we're not mentoring. We're mentoring each other. Right. And so pe- people don't get that, but that's really exciting. Yeah. And I think it's important to have people in front or ahead of us people that are discipling us and people at the same level, for lack of a better way of saying it, and folks that we're helping to where we are so that there's that continual movement together. Yeah. And I like the way that you said it's almost like a wave just moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, So if you could tell a pastor, like look them right in the eyes, say um, if somebody what discipleship program do you have at the church, sir? Um, what would you say? So if, if they were asking me? Yep. Okay, so if they were asking me, I would say we're in the transition process of moving back toward face-to-face with the Scripture. Um, we haven't chucked everything or thrown out everything that we have ever done. You know, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But we are striving to lean heavier on spending time in the word, not spending time in other people's books. And we're not there yet. Yeah, I, I made a mistake early on in, in the ministry here of buying on to the using videos for everything and all of our small group leaders just being facilitators. Some yeah. folks are gifted at that, and that's fantastic. But what we're finding is now, you know, where I used to be able to say, yes, we use this uh provider for material. I don't want to name a provider necessarily, but uh, we use this provider for material and DVDs and Bible studies and anything they give you is good. Can't do that anymore. Uh, And so I want to go back to teaching the leaders how to interact with the scriptures. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the thing that I'm trying to get at is, um, the discipleship, I was telling you about four quadrants. I only added the two quadrants, which are, let's say you have four quadrants. And um, I added two because my friend was the one that was saying, you know, the church doesn't have a discipleship program and he mm-hmm. loves apologetics. Mm-hmm. And then he goes and puts that in play by evangelism. Yeah. But what I'm seeing from what you, what I'm seeing right now mm-hmm. is the, the quadrants that I have is, people need to understand what a disciple is first Mm -hmm. before they can call themselves one. Mm -hmm. And then they need to move forward in understanding how to study the Bible correctly so that they don't get deceived when they're trying to do it. Right. You know what I mean? And so, so I'm back to just those two focus points. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, you've now confirmed to me that the road that we're on of studying mm-hmm. scripture um, in a group like that, right. husbands and wives, and, and is very, very, very powerful. Right. Yeah. And, and there are going to be people who say it's too difficult. It is difficult. Yep. Yeah. I mean, so we. the cross. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that difficult. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm telling you, the what's really troublesome to me is 
the amount of uh, deception coming into the church. You have you have progressives. Um, the younger the people are, the more progressive they want to be. Yeah. Um, you have this whole Torah keeping Hebrew roots movement, right? Which um, really is a type of false gospel. Although yeah. they really love God and they want um, they want to make sure that they cover all their bases. Except for the problem is he covered the bases with his blood. Right. And gave us a new covenant. Yeah. So um, how does it go ahead? You were going to say. No, no, I was agreeing with you. You're good. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really frustrating to. Um, uh, and, and again, for me, I, I was outside of the church for so many years mm -hmm. that even some of the lingo that you use. I don't, I don't know about like this whole navigators. I hear all the time, the net, the navigators disciple wheel. Right. I don't know what that is. Right. And apparently you can put your finger on it and go, you can, you're showing yourself crawling, right? I've never done that before, but yeah, I, I mean, because the whole wheel idea is Christ is the center Yeah. that uh, you're studying the word, you're praying, you're witnessing, uh, and you're having fellowship with other believers. Right. So I don't think that the the man who came up with that wheel would want people to to be so attached to the wheel that they miss Jesus. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh and, and 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 that's and then we can. Yeah. And uh, and I have to be careful with saying praiseworthy life too. We want to live a praiseworthy life because that can get so rote for people that they sure. they, they don't hear it anymore. Just yeah. like disciple um, I've had to go and define disciple for myself. I've sure. had to go and define faith. Um, you know, remember I said I was in the charismatic Pentecostal world um, in, in the middle of the uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. And the, the most amazing thing is I had to, I had to go study myself. I mm -hmm. had to, I had said, okay, here's how I'm looking at this through a filter. I need to yeah. You know, I need to I need to know if what I believe is what I believe. Yeah. 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 The best de definition, best simple definition that I've heard of faith in a long time was actually from Dr. Tony Evans when he said faith is believing that God is telling the truth. Yeah, I'll I'll restate it this way. In yeah. our men's Bible study, I was bringing this up and I was about to come to this point and. Um, um, a man that has been on the mission field and a pastor for many years. Uh, it's got cancer now, but um, he picked up his old Bible that was worn out. And he said, um, we put our full weight and trust in God's word. Yeah. And that's faith. Yeah. And you just said exactly what, to what he just said with Tony yeah. Evans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause I always tell, ask folks, well, what was Adam and Eve's sin? And they said, well, they ate the fruit. They go, oh, that's an action as a result of what? Yeah. Not believing God's word. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And see, I think that that's the sin that even if you look at Romans chapter one, when it's talking about uh, not uh, recognizing who God is and giving him his proper place and suppressing the truth. And that's why sin is so horrendous. Yes. and deserves the the penalty that it deserves is because we who have been made in God's image have thrown that back in his face exactly. and said, I will be God. Right. And even with the, um, uh, you know, the transformers, let's call them, mm -hmm. um, you're actually shaking your fist and saying, and the enemy's attacking the image of God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so yeah, you're exactly correct. It's um, yeah, I mean, it, there's so much. It's so blatant now, um, and I think Christians are starting to realize that yeah. they're undergunned and underpowered. Yeah. And I like what Dr. Jordan Peterson said. He said, "We've we've backpedaled little tiny increments, and now yeah. we're in a bad spot. Yep. We haven't stood up. Now it's time to stand up." Yeah, in love, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one last thing, if you could give anybody advice, what would you do, say? Uh, advice for? This what? this new paradigm in December. Okay, okay. So I, I would say start reading the scripture yourself 
and invite somebody to read along with you. Yep. Don't worry about not knowing everything. Yep. Sometimes not knowing something causes you to dig in. If they ask a question that you don't understand or you don't know the answer to, dig in together. Right. Then come back together because you're going to grow in your faith or I'm going to grow in my faith and that other person is going to grow as well. And so that's I think I, I would say read the Bible and bring somebody along with you. <laughs> that's exactly what Christ did. Yeah. Anyways, you just got done uh, fishing. Let's yes. go. Yep. So well, well, that would awesome. be my advice. Yeah. Is it okay if I pray for you um, and just tell you thanks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Please. Father, we just lift up our hearts to you today. And I just want to thank you for Pastor Scott Duncan, Dr. Duncan. And uh, I just want to tell you that um, I, you brought him in my life at the very right time um, and was so impactful, his question to me about um, put keeping me on the right track about what I've seen actually inadvertently work in people's lives. And you know what, what a wonderful witnessing tool to say to your neighbors and friends and, um, Hey, how would you like to study the Bible with me? And if they say no, they say no. Um, but you never know what will happen to them. And so Lord, I just ask you to bless Scott and his church and his ministry and bless this podcast um, for pastors to have their hearts encouraged and uh, for people that are sitting in the pew to have their hearts. And I think we need to take Scott's admonition very clearly uh, as a mentor, as a leader in this and say, you know what, we're going to grab somebody and let's, let's go study together. And um, Lord, we love you and appreciate you. And we ask your kingdom to come on us and your will to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Rick, thank you for inviting me on. I appreciate the opportunity and, and the honor. Yep. And I'll uh, put it up for you and you can have a, um, Mary will do the edits and you'll, and we'll send you a copy. Okay. Thank you. All right. Blessings. Blessings on you. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Yes.